Uh, Bill Nussie is CEO and founder of Freeing Energy and CEO and co-founder of Solar Inventions. Bill's a 25-year tech CEO with several exits, including an IPO. His companies have created thousands of jobs and billions in shareholder value. Along the way, he also worked at Greylock as a venture capitalist. And after selling his marketing tech company to IBM, he was promoted to vice president corporate strategy to help lead IBM's global strategy for their CEO and senior vice presidents. In 2017, he jumped into clean energy. It started with a TED Talk, which grew into more than 100 articles and then became a top energy podcast. And as of late 2021, a book called Freeing Energy, which has hit Amazon's number one new release in three categories, solar, energy, and energy policy. He also has a startup called Solar Inventions that is commercializing a patented breakthrough in the manufacturing process of silicon PV. He has a degree in electrical engineering from North Carolina State University and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Bill, welcome to California, San Diego, and to our gathering of clean energy and climate solution advocates. We are so happy to have you. Kathy and Merrill, thanks for inviting me. You know, I, when I was in, a, uh, in my 30s, my wife and I sat down and we made a spreadsheet and we looked at all the places we could live all over the world. And uh, the top two came down to Atlanta was right on top and San Diego was right below it. We, had, we moved to Atlanta and have been here ever since. But San Diego has always had a massive place in my heart. And uh, if I didn't have such deep roots here now, I'd probably come join you guys. But uh, California is a magnificent state, um, as is Georgia. But we, we all have our idiosyncrasies, and we'll talk a little bit about some of them today. But this is, this is great to be here. And uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and make sure that you guys can see it okay. All right, does that work? Can you guys see it? Okay, good, I see a thumbs up. Well, I'm just gonna jump right in and uh, I'm gonna try to keep it uh, under an hour and then uh, lots of time for Q&A uh, if there is any. So, you know, I've spent the last five years working on a question which is how can entrepreneurs and innovators participate in the clean energy revolution? And what can they do, particularly as you think about um, Silicon Valley, uh, not explicitly, but the ethos of Silicon Valley and how it really has changed the way we think about technology growth and what can we learn from that? How can we leverage that to accelerate the transition to clean energy? And so that's really what my book is about. That's what the, the podcast is about. Uh, the podcast has recently been ranked number one podcast in renewable energy. We're very proud of that. We've got a small team of volunteers doing all this work, and uh, it seems to be making a difference. And uh, so I didn't realize that when we started tonight that I, there would be sort of an earlier video by which to compare the video I'm going to show you. So, you know, depending on whether you like sort of singing and bespoke lyrics or you like sort of the more, um, you know, uh, traditional businessy videos, but I have a video for you guys uh, that will give you a quick introduction to the local energy concept uh, and save me a lot of time and talking and monotone presentations. So here goes and, and um, chat me or, or speak up if you can't hear or has a problem. Electricity with the simple flick of a switch, we effortlessly engage the most sophisticated and essential machine ever built the electric grid. Widespread electrification took hold in the early 20th century, promising convenience and prosperity to millions. Innovation flourished. Early grids were small and local. Communities were deeply intertwined with the electricity they generated and consumed. But a seemingly endless supply of fossil fuels and a quest to make electricity universally available gave rise to a new electric business model, the regulated monopoly. These monopolies invested trillions of dollars to build enormous power plants and millions of miles of power lines. All this vast infrastructure created economies of scale, making electricity safe, 
reliable, and affordable for the masses. Electricity became an invisible pillar of our society, a catalyst for the prosperity of a nation and much of the world. This exuberance allowed a small but important change to go unnoticed. These monopolies were shifting control of energy from individuals and communities into the hands of giant corporations and government regulators. Unburdened by competition, the industry stagnated. Guaranteed profits led to complacency. Research declined, lobbying increased. Preserving the monopoly took precedence over innovation and customer choice. The grid that transformed society in the 20th century remains stuck in time. Its design and business model are outdated and its cost and consequences are rising. Burning coal and fracking natural gas leave behind millions of tons of harmful substances that poison our air, land, and water. Nuclear waste that is lethally radioactive for 10,000 years collects in casks outside our plants. The grid is dangerous. Power lines spark wildfires, destroy communities and lives. Nuclear meltdowns leave massive exclusion zones. Extended outages cost thousands of lives. The grid is vulnerable. Floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, and even cyber attacks are causing more frequent and longer outages. The grid is inequitable. It remains unreliable, unaffordable, or outright unavailable for billions of the world's most economically vulnerable people. And the grid is unsustainable. Power plants use more water than farming. Greenhouse gases foul our atmosphere. Aging power plants rely on an endless cycle of extracting and burning fuels. The 20th century grid is increasingly disconnected from our 21st century priorities and technologies. It is outdated and in dire need of change. These grand challenges are giving rise to a new generation of innovation. A new economic and technology model is emerging. A model that is simpler, cleaner, and cheaper. A model that renews electricity's original promise of individuals and communities once again controlling their energy future. Welcome to the 21st century and the rebirth of energy freedom. Oops. One moment, I will re resume the presentation. All right. There we go. All right. Uh, so I love that video. I've seen it so many times. It's a gets a little boring, but uh, we it does a great job of framing what I'm going to talk about today. And but I want to start off with sort of a thought exercise about climate change. And you know, only a month or so ago, uh, a groundbreaking IPCC report came out. I'm sure all of you have uh, gone through it, if not read it in detail. And the punchline is that we basically have till the rest of the decade to make a substantial difference in our carbon emissions if we want to head off, have any chance of heading off massive uh, damaging climate change. And so when we think, when we listen to the experts and the politicians, uh, you know, what can we do? I get frustrated because I hear the same things over and over again, and it doesn't make sense to me. Um, so let me give you an example. So we hear about the president, uh, who I'm very glad he's doing as much as he is, but I wish he was doing a lot more. But one of the things that the uh, federal government and a lot of states focus on is transmission. The DOE has recently announced several initiatives uh, to accelerate transmission. But the problem is that building out these power lines takes an average of 10 years to build. So if, the, if those of us on the Zoom today decided to make a, a transmission line from Georgia, where I live in Atlanta, to San Diego, um, we could expect it to take seven, maybe 10 years. Uh, uh, the largest grid operator in the United States has announced uh, about a month ago, they're putting a two year pause on reviewing new solar interconnection requests for large scale solar projects, pushing most decisions out to 2027. 
you know, uh, the cost of transmission building out these large scale systems is uh, actually the single largest increasing cost is wind and solar become cheaper every year, the cost of transmission becomes higher. Uh, utilities are expected to spend $140 billion in the next two years uh, just building out transmission. So nuclear is a, is a controversial topic among clean energy enthusiasts, but outside of whether you're, you think they're fantastic or they're a problem, they, they have some real challenges. The plants take decades to build. You know, other than the uh, nuclear power plant being built just down the road from me here in Georgia and uh, uh, called the Vogel plant, there is no other new nuclear plant plant uh, planned for this decade. And uh, you know, if you know anything about Vogel, it's it's not a good example of what we might hope for if we try to build more nuclear. Uh, it's currently at 16 years after countless delays. Um, it's also um, uh, almost over uh, double over budget, expected to be about $25 billion. And about uh, 10 billion of that is from a US loan guarantee from the government. So the economics of these things are really tough. In fact, a lot of people, I ask people, uh, you know, what's the most expensive way to generate electricity? And most people who don't live in the world like we all do say, well, solar and, and wind are the most expensive because those are the premiums. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, this is a, an average of about five of the most reputable uh, numbers. But um, you know, coal and nuclear, ironically, are the most expensive. Uh, quick caveat, if, you, um, uh, if we use existing nuclear plants, they're very cheap. So uh, a lot of folks think that using, continuing to use the ones we've built is smart. And I think we'll see that trend uh, last for the next couple of decades, because once it's built, it's super cheap to run it. Um, and, you know, everyone here on the phone would love it if the state or federal government could get out of their own way and somehow make climate change not this partisan issue that it's become, could make clean energy not this partisan issue. But right now, the politicians are uh, f effectively doing especially at the federal level, doing virtually nothing towards the climate emergency. So as all these debates and all this arm wrestling goes on, you know, the status quo gets worse. Uh, severe weather is increasing every year. Uh, the, uh, the number of outages is going up. You guys have probably read, uh, and you, you should if you haven't, the number of uh, reports coming out from like uh, NERC, the, the Federal uh, Energy Security Group, that's saying that we should expect a record number of blackouts this summer as heat waves crisscross the country and stress grids beyond their design. Uh, as you guys probably also know that um, the massive drought that's taking place where you live and, and in uh, other parts of the United States uh, is causing the lake levels, reservoir levels to go so low that hydropower plants are having to shut off. Um, so hydropower has been one of the more reliable and certainly one of the oldest sources of electricity and many of the old hydro plants, hydropower plants uh, are already severe, severely cutting back the electricity they generate. And some are very likely to be turned off this summer when there's so little water to flow over their, their sluices. You know, we, you, we're all very focused. Your group's very focused on climate change. But one of the biggest things that surprised me when I was working on this book, I, I think the number one thing that surprised me was how nasty pollution is. Uh, not greenhouse gases, just plain old pollution. I, I didn't realize, I assumed, you know, I'm a tech person. I've been growing tech companies, software bits and bytes and computer software and servers and things like that, internet for most of my career. And so I assumed that these things I read about were environmentally were, um, you know, they were being amplified by people with agendas. And I figured that they couldn't be nearly as bad as everyone was saying, because of course, you know, societies, governments wouldn't let these things happen. Well, I have, I learned the hard way that um, the degree of pollution beyond carbon, beyond carbon, that uh, is a consequence of particularly coal, uh, exceeded anything I could have imagined. You know, a lot of people don't know that the largest industrial spill in the history of the United States, uh, 40 times worse by volume than the XN Valdez spill, got virtually no press, was a coal ash spill in Kingston, Tennessee, about a decade ago. Uh, it covered 3,000 acres of land, uh, destroyed homes, and this stuff is absolutely full of nasty chemicals, chromium and arsenic. Uh, I believe in the 
One day that this was released, the arsenic that went downstream and hit the communities was more arsenic in one day than the entire, power, all power plants and all coal burning power plants put into the environment in the course of a year. I mean, this was, it was a tr tragic amount. And, you know, so who's looking after this for us? Well, the electric monopolies. Uh, I have a lot of respect for electric monopolies. And if you read my book, you'll, you'll see that, but they are also part of the problem. Uh, a fact that a very few people know, but it's uh, cited in two different sources in my book because it's a bit contentious, is that of all the industries in the United States, including uh, car dealerships and um, uh, you know, uh, golf courses, uh, the, the lowest d percentage of R&D of any industry in the United States is electric utilities. They spend less than 0.1% of their budget on research and development. And uh, across the United States, um, lobbying budgets are only uh, legally required to be disclosed at a federal level. But as you guys know, electric, electric utilities are entirely legislated and managed and regulated at the state level. So in very few states, certainly not Georgia, most states do not require corporations or utilities to disclose their lobbying levels. But experts suggest that utilities are probably the single largest lobbying budgets as a percentage of their revenue of any industry in the United States. And so if you look at the fact that they're the largest lobbying and the smallest r and it tells you an awful lot about these companies. And let me see if I can uh, give you an example. I, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a serious nerd, right? And so, and I love movies. So I'm going to, there's this uh, movie called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It's a stupid movie and I love it. And then in this movie, these two bozos go, find a time machine to go back in time. Uh, and I always think like, how cool would it be to have a time machine? And so what I would do if I had a time machine is I'd go back and I'd, I'd, I'd meet Orville and Wilbur Wright as they took off at Kitty Hawk. And I'd bring them into 2022 and I'd put them in a 747 and I'd put them in an F-15 or an F-22 and say, look at this invention that you created just a hundred years ago. Look what, look what has come from that invention. It has changed everything. And the same time from the 20s, I'd go back to um, Alexander Graham Bell and uh, uh, Watson come here, right? And I'd bring him forward to 2022 and I'd hold up my iPhone for him. And I would say, this device is a direct descendant of that invention. It's, it's the core idea, but this device has grown into something that with 10 digits, I can reach every human being on the planet or 7 billion people. I have this access to the sum total of all human knowledge within a few presses. But then I would take that time machine back to some of my personal heroes, Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, George Westinghouse, Sam Insel, and I would bring them forward and I would show them uh, the, the, the legacy that they created. And they would look at a modern substation and it would look identical in every single way to them. And I would show them a coal plant. And while it is different in, in some details, they would say the idea is exactly the same. Um, and they would say, what have you guys been doing? Why is it that airplanes and computers and telephony and these other technologies have completely revolutionized and changed society, but electricity, as we invented it in the 20s, is identical. The systems are identical. The regulatory model is unchanged. Um, it's, you know, what, what have you guys been doing? And I like to point out, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that there's only uh, three regulated monopolies that are still very uh, broadly nationally uh, running in the United States, um, it's, I believe it's um, alcohol, gambling, and electricity. Go figure. But anyway, um, so I, I want to, before you digest this too much, I want to be clear, we absolutely need transmission. Uh, we need to get those wind and solar, those giant wind and solar farms up and running and, and, and sharing across the country. We need utilities. Um, you know, you, when I started this work, I thought that we would all be off grid running our own solar batteries and that we would no longer need utilities. And I have uh, come full circle to believe that utilities are a critical part of our future. However, with a different business model and different incentives than we've given them for the last hundred years. We need, we need big wind, we need big solar, but we don't have to wait on them. So, you know, provocative question, you kind of know the answer if you tuned in today, but you know, what if we had a solution that was actually faster by 10, 100x than the big systems? What if we had something that was cheaper? What if we had something that was far more resilient, especially as climate change, severe weather, uh, droughts are causing the grid to become less reliable? 
Uh, what if we had something that would actually allow us to directly immediately address uh, uh, energy equity, uh, helping the, the disadvantaged communities immediately um, lower their electricity bills and increase their, their resilience and reduce the pollution they deal with? And what if it was more innovative? And, you know, I'm a tech tech person for most of my career. I'm a, you know, you get, you, you talk about innovation and that's when my ears perk up. And the answer is local energy. You know, I, I didn't make up this term local energy, but I've adopted it. Uh, you, if you guys know the electricity space, you can think of it as behind the meter or uh, distributed energy resources, DERs. It goes by a lot of different names. But the reason that I wanted to call it local energy, the reason I gave it in the book, this, this um, relatively less well-known name is that all of the other names that describe rooftop solar and community solar and building integrated solar and microgrids and batteries, all the names that describe those are technical and they reflect the status quo and they do nothing to talk about the benefits of the communities and families that can employ these local energy systems. And so the name local energy goes more than just the way it's connected to the grid or disconnected. It speaks to the communities uh, and the jobs and the entirety of benefits that local energy offers. And I'm going to take you through them. It, local energy is massively faster to build. It is the cleanest, fastest way uh, to generate electricity. Uh, it is far more resilient. It's more innovative. It creates far more jobs which is something nobody's focused on. And it's actually cheaper than electricity from the grid. And I'm gonna talk about that because I have been many, many conversations and the conversation, uh, somebody always points out, even strong advocates of rooftop solar to say, well, of course it is much cheaper to build giant solar farms in, in fields and deserts. So, you know, local uh, rooftop solar is always gonna be a lot more expensive. Well, I'm gonna to try to poke a hole in that myth for you today. So let me talk about the speed, right? We talked about building on transmission seven to 10 years. We talk about large uh, solar projects, large you know, 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt solar projects. These things can take five to six years. Um, as you know, um, just the interconnection permitting can take three or four years. And that's before uh, PJM added a two year, just in, in initiated a two year hiatus. And 75% of the large projects large solar projects and large wind projects literally drop out because they run out of money waiting for regulatory approval to be connected to the grid. Uh, in the United States, we in most places we can decide to buy rooftop solar, we can install it and have it operating within one or two months. But here's something provocative for you to consider. If you live in Australia, you can have somebody, you can go online, order a solar array for your roof, and you can be generating, it can be installed and generating power the next day. Think about that. Uh, in the United States, it's a month or two to install and provision and interconnect a solar rooftop array. Um, in Australia, it's one or two days. And I'll tell you how that works and what we can do about it in the US. By the way, that's with the exact same equipment in, in Australia, the same inverters, the same solar panels, the same labor, same labor rates. Um, it's pretty amazing how difficult the United States regulatory system makes putting solar up. Local energy is a lot more resilient. Uh, when you add a battery to your rooftop solar, um, you are in a position to withstand the vast majority of extreme weather outages. You know, as I speak to you today, this uh, my my residential batteries uh, are uh, slowly producing power for the house to power my computer, my internet connection. So we are, uh, despite it being deep night here in Georgia, uh, we are solar powered for, for my contribution to this conversation. You know, and one of the things that I get so passionate about is that solar is cheaper. And this is why utilities are fighting so hard to keep the solar build out with, within the utilities. They want to own the solar because adding solar increases their profits, uh, which is, a, by the way, a fine, uh, fine goal for any corporation. Uh, but there, but you, several utilities, hundreds sometimes, depending on how you measure it, are actively fighting 
people putting their own solar up. And when you, but when you are able to do it, uh, the profits that solar represents flow to the communities and the families. If they don't go to Wall Street and to giant uh, bondholders, uh, they don't go into the round trip to the lobbyists, to the politicians, um, they actually go directly into the families. And uh, this is something that anyone who's ever put solar on the roof has, most people have experienced that their bills go down. Uh, and the only reason everyone's not doing it currently is that um, a lot of people don't have the credit to put the system up or they just haven't, just, they just haven't been ready to try it. But uh, every single day, the price of solar is going down. And uh, actually it's a little bit up right now, but uh, year to year, the price of solar goes down and uh, it's gonna continue going down for decades. I'll talk about that in a second. Now, now here's something that very few people talk about and I couldn't find the statistic anywhere. So I, I had to spend a week finding the source data. Uh, it's all in my book, it's all on my website, um, in, in totally defensible data. Um, when you build a megawatt of rooftop solar, you are creating 10 times more jobs than if you put a megawatt in a giant field or a desert, 10 times more jobs. So with all these politicians in, in DC and in state and state houses talking about creating jobs with renewable energy, well, realize that if you streamline local energy, rooftop solar, community solar, you're going to create 10 times more jobs. Those get you votes. And, and whether you're, uh, you know, you're a conservative or a liberal, or progressive or far right, everybody wants jobs. That's the universal concept. And local energy is one of the best jobs creators that has ever been invented. And this is my stuff. I get excited about this. Local energy is very innovative. Um, when you put up a microgrid um, or just a solar battery system like I have in my house, you know, when I, when I put that system up, I didn't have to go file an a IRP, a three-year IRP with the, uh, with the uh, Utilities Commission. I didn't have to do a, an environmental study that takes a year. I didn't have to um, worry about uh, a million other things that utilities do. I just had four or five companies bid on it, and I chose from five or six competing technologies. It was exactly like buying a car or a computer or a, a smartphone. I just had I had choices. They were competitive. The products were compelling. I chose a couple that I liked, picked a firm to install them, and that experience, which is relatively new, uh, and very few people, even though it's available today, very few people are choosing to buy rooftop solar in the United States, and even fewer are buying batteries with it. But this market is competitive for the first time in 100 years of uh, electric energy. And this competition is driving innovation to a level that uh, the energy industry has not seen in its history, or at least not since Thomas Edison was lighting up the first grid powered by the Pearl Street power station in lower Manhattan. This is another point that people sort of understand loosely, but I'd like to make it explicitly. Um, Local energy is cleaner. If you're concerned about the environment, and, and we all are, but you're looking for something to do personally. Um, if you have a rooftop that you have access to and you have the credit to buy these systems, you can have an immediate and sustained impact on climate change more than virtually anything else you can do. I have research that I've cited in the book um, and you can choose to eat bacon, you can choose to uh, limit your use of uh, fossil fuel based transportation. Um, but if you have a roof and you use an average size uh, solar installation of six kilowatts, which is the national average, um, you will abate more carbon through that decision than anything else you can do. Your carbon reduction will, from putting solar on your roof is the single largest way you can reduce your personal carbon footprint. And if you don't have a roof or you don't have the credit, you can go to community solar in a lot of places in the US and tap into a larger solar array somewhere you know, in the periphery of your community. But just to look at some specific numbers, you know, we have a lot of coal powered electricity here in Georgia. I think we're the, one of the largest coal powered states. And so if I put a rooftop solar six kilowatts up, I'm gonna generate about a megawatt hour of power or energy, I should say, over the course of a month, one megawatt hour. That keeps a half a ton of coal in the ground every single month, next month, last month. All I got to do is let this system sit on my roof and a half ton of coal stays in the ground. 
and 2,100 pounds, a full ton of CO2 stays out of the air. 16,000 gallons of water are not used um, and 185 pounds of coal ash waste um, will never be produced. Fun fact, uh, there are 2 billion tons of coal ash waste uh, have been collected in 750 coal ash ponds around the United States. Um, every year, we generate 100 million tons of coal ash waste, even with the dra dramatic reduction in coal usage. 100 million tons are generated every year. It's the single largest waste stream uh, of any kind other than municipal, municipal garbage in the United States. Um, and the reason you don't think about it is because it's all of it, all of it is dumped in ponds in the back of the coal plant. And I don't know about any of you guys, I've never actually visited a coal plant. I've tried to. Uh, but I've never been able to visit a coal plant. And so I've never seen it. And if I did, it just looks like a lake, um, but it contains some pretty nasty stuff. And there's a giant lawsuit right now wor working through the last couple of decades about dozens and dozens of people who, are, who have died and a couple hundred that have advanced cancer uh, from having uh, cleaned up the Tennessee Valley, uh, the, the coal ash spill I so showed you the picture of earlier. Um, and they were told they couldn't wear masks. They were told the collage is perfectly safe. Um, and the death rate and the cancer rate is off the charts compared to the other communities where people did not wade through waist deep to clean that stuff up. This is nasty stuff. But, you know, not everyone is concerned um, about the environment. Um, but many of the people that aren't concerned about the environment are very concerned about national security. And I think that Local energy is one of the single best solutions to address the growing threat of cyber attacks on the United States. Uh, you know, I could fill this page, pages, a whole deck on the stuff that you don't hear about, you don't read about, but experts are in agreement on that the U.S. grid is incredibly at risk for cyber attacks. And um, as you know, um, Ukraine, before the war started, was the recipient of a Russian cyber attack, the first known time, provable time, where a foreign actor infiltrated someone's grid and took it out. Um, and uh, uh, John, uh, John Wellinghoff here uh, said in a private memo that got leaked to the media about 10 years ago, he said, there's, there's 10 substations in the United States and one transformer manufacturer. If you take those out, um, you will take out the electric grid for the, United, the entire United States for three months to a year. Um, it was never intended to be made public. Uh, and uh, uh, retired CIA Director James Woolsey uh, said that um, uh, it is well, if, if we have the kind of coordinated attack, say from an EMP, um, the entire United States grid would be down for as much as a year. And the consequences of that are, are unimaginable. But both of these folks have gone on record and have written extensively that if you want to address the risks, the national security risks of cyber attacks, local energy is the way to do it. You put up microgrids, you put up batteries, you put up solar, that is the best way um, because instead of having a dozen points of target, uh, you have millions. Um, and you know the, the IT world I come from, they call it security through diversity and uh, it works. But if there is a single concept that permeates all political ideologies, uh, that gets past any points of view about uh, you know, environmentalism or, or profits, it's that local energy is cheaper. It's cheaper. And so I, I like to tell a story. I was interviewing the, uh, the number three guy at a giant, well-known electric utility, and uh, he knew what he was talking. He knew what I was asking about, and he was a little guarded. And he said, um, "He said, listen, I, I'm all for people that want to be environmentally minded, and I am happy if they want to put solar rooftop, solar on the roofs. And if it makes them happy, that's great. But Bill, I'm a dollars and cents, pencil it out kind of person, and I can tell you that it's flat out cheaper." to build solar in a giant field at big scale than it is to put it on the roof. That's it, it's just cheaper. And so I let that hang there in the air for a few minutes, or a few moments. And I said, 
It's cheaper for you. It's not cheaper for me. And he's thinking about that for a minute. And I said, so if you put up a hundred megawatt solar system, you know, a hundred miles south of where I live here in Atlanta, is my electricity bill going to go down? Well, no, no. I mean, it's, you know, I said, no, no, it's not. It's not going to go down at all. But if I put a solar rooftop, if I put solar panels on my roof, my electricity bill is going to go down the next day. So why is it that when we talk about large scale solar being cheaper, that we are um, voluntarily using the perspective that the, of the utilities. Why do we put ourselves in the shoes of the utilities when we talk about what solar costs? Why don't we put ourselves in our own shoes and say, solar is cheaper for me to put it on my roof than it is for you utility to put it in the field? Again, we need both of those. We need both kinds, but let's get rid of this ridiculous argument that putting it 100 megawatt solar plant in a desert is cheaper. It isn't cheaper. It's cheaper for the utility. Their profits will go up and your bill will stay the same or go up. So let me give you some specific numbers. And again, you guys probably see a lot of graphs. Um, I've read a lot of books. Uh, there's actually 500 books on climate change. I uh, just finished Speed and Scale. So one thing I tried to do with the book that I hadn't seen done anywhere else was not only cite sources for every single graph, every single idea, but only use sources that were absolutely unimpeachable and um, uh, 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 um, undebatable, I should say. I'm sorry, struggling for the word. But uh, so I only use, um, I don't use any data from environmental groups. I don't use any data from uh, advocacy groups. I only use raw data from government websites the transcend who's running the government at the time. And, um, and, and so when you see a graph like this, it's not just, it, it's actually an amalgamation of multiple different studies pulled together into a consensus. And so this is a really powerful graph. So a lot of people, when they think about solar being expensive, they might've looked at it five years ago for the roof and they said, well, you know, it was, was, was gonna make, take up my electricity bill a little bit or just was a lot of hassle. But what happened, and one of the reasons I decided that now was the time to get into energy and now was the time the local energy was going to change, was in the last year or so, it actually became cheaper on average in the United States to put solar on your roof and power some portion of your electric bill that way rather than getting those kilowatt hours from the grid. But the crazy part is that the price of electricity from solar panels when people put them up in a year and two years and five years, the price of that electricity will be getting cheaper and cheaper because the panels are getting more efficient, labor rates are going down, soft costs are getting reduced. And so what happens is that today, you know, it's, well, in California, it's, uh, it's actually quite a bit cheaper to have rooftop solar. But here in Georgia, we have an uh, average of 11, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So rooftop solar is only now becoming cheaper. Um, but when you go out in um, four or five years, you know, Georgia Power, who, who provides uh, the power for my home when I'm not using battery and solar, they're, they're projecting that their costs are going to go continue to go up materially, way above inflation rates, mostly because they have a, power, a nuclear power plant that's double over budget. It's the single largest project they've ever done. Uh, and so uh, we don't need the electricity because Georgia, our actually per capita electricity is going down. But um, years ago, they thought it was a good idea. And so we have this um, power plant we don't need and we're going to pay for it. And great news is if you're a shareholder in Southern Company or Georgia Power, you're covered. Got no issues. But as somebody who pays the bills, my bills are going up. Uh, and I got to pay that, the, that charge whether I use solar or not. And so fortunately, if I add on to my solar panels in five years to get more capacity, that price will get cheaper and cheaper going all the way down, um, down to being the, uh, one quarter of the price. So think about it, solar is not just going to be cheaper, it is going to be so ridiculously cheaper um, that it's been going to become inevitable and irresistible. I like to say of Americans that um, we got a lot on our plates, we're distracted by a lot of issues. And so, you know, if you're looking at apples and apples, you know, it's going to be a, a dollar here for my utility, a dollar here for my solar, maybe 90 cents for my solar. I got a lot of things going on, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, but when you go to most people in America and you say, but you know what, we can cut your electricity bill in half by putting solar on your roof. 
Um, I have been told that utilities have too much political power and they're going to stop it. And I would argue that Americans um, past a certain point, if you tell them that you want them to pay twice as much as every other country in the world, twice as much as they should pay, just so a bunch of gigantic corporations they've never heard of can have really comfortable profits, it's just not going to work. Um, and I think maybe one of the biggest challenges with solar is that, that it was born out of environmental uh, motivations. And I think that, and it still serves those motivations, but I think people who are looking at it freshly st still see that patina and um, they discount it because if they don't feel strongly about environmentalism. And the fact is that rooftop solar is crazy cheaper. Uh, it will be crazy cheaper than any other alternative. It's irresistible. And oh, but what about batteries? Because batteries are too expensive and, and uh, rooftop solar is great, and, you know, but I need that metering to make it work. And uh, batteries aren't, batteries are following the same cost curve as solar. And, and if you do end up reading my book, you'll be pleasantly surprised to see that there was way, there are far more interesting and novel ways to make battery storage than there are to make photovoltaic panels. So the amount of innovation we're gonna see in batteries is just getting started. Um, I interviewed one of the top battery scientists in the world who's now a venture capitalist. And he said that it's quite reasonable to see long-term storage getting down below $10 a kilowatt hour. It's already dropped 10 times in the last decade um, and it's going to continue dropping. Uh, it's gonna probably drop another 10 times in the next 10 years. And so all of a sudden adding batteries into your home or the economics of a electric vehicle are going to be just absolutely compelling. It's not going to be a trade-off. It's You're not going to be, well, maybe I could help the environment. Maybe I could pay some more money. I don't know. It's going to be an absolute layup. You know, how many of you guys uh, still use an old Polaroid camera, right? Or the, the Kodak um, uh, 35 millimeter? Probably nobody. Probably everybody uses one of these, right? Uh, when I went to business school, there was a case study and the professor said, you know, one day, digital cameras are going to be so cheap that we're going to quit using film. Shows how old I am in terms of when I went to business school. But uh, uh, I could not have I looked back and he was so right that the technology curve just made the digital technology irresistible. And that's where we're going with solar and batteries. And I think it's a quick digression. It's worth mentioning that when the reason solar and batteries are so uniquely dropping in price is because they're technologies. The technology is just like your phone. They use silicon and silver and solder, and um, they are, they're not fuels, and they are not machines. And so solar, um, if you think about uh, manufacturing scale, right? You think about economies of scale. So for the first 100 years of electricity, our goal was to make bigger and bigger power plants because the economies of scale, the larger you make it, the smaller the, the marginal cost of each new kilowatt that comes out of it. Well, about 10 years ago, that reversed. Uh, we, we made plants as large as we could and they, the complexity of the plants overtook the savings. And so all of a sudden we have nuclear power plants now, which are the largest power plants. And they're actually quite a bit more expensive because they're so large and complex. Economies of scale have tapped out in the power industry. Um, on the other hand, um, manufacturing volumes, what are called Wright's Law, the more manufacturing capacity we build, the cheaper each unit produced becomes. And these, this graph here is a perfect example. The blue line is the amount of capacity of batteries, battery factories in the world. And as that blue line goes up, the price will go down. And that's, it's been proven across every kind of technology, flat screen televisions, mobile phones, computers, solar panels, inverters, batteries, everything um, follows some curve like this. You're probably familiar with the most famous uh, implementation of that Moore's law, which is what's uh, the reason that uh, computers have declined so aggressively. It's the same concept. And, and wind turbines, I'm a big fan of wind, but wind turbines are machines. They, are, they cannot be manufactured in, in their entirety in factories. Um, they are complex machines that require the kind of maintenance, uh, installation, and decommissioning the machines do. And uh, as a result, um, and they will only get cheaper as they get larger. So that we're quickly approaching, what we have approached and surpassed, uh, making larger terrestrial wind turbines larger. Uh, they're so large now, they can't ship the wind turbine blades 
over air. So all the next generation of wind turbines are being built offshore because you don't have the constraint of roads and things like that. Um, but at some point, they're going to be too large to be tenable. But solar and batteries aren't locked into that economies of scale math. Uh, we just need to make more of them and they get cheaper. So you might've seen that graph, this, this graph right here, well, Bill, how in the heck can it get so much cheaper? Well, here's an interesting fact that very few people know is that in the United States, when we put up solar on our rooftops, it's between $2.80 and $3.80 a watt. So you put up a, a 10,000 watt system, a 10 kW system, it's gonna be uh, $38,000, $30,000. If you take the exact same solar panels, the exact same inverter, the exact same uh, uh, people installing it on the roof for this roughly the same labor rates in Australia, um, that is going to cost an Australian a dollar ten in U.S. dollars, one third the price. And so, and this has nothing to do with they're using the same panels, the same cells. The U.S. is just a uh, Swiss cheese rat's nest, rat's, net, rat's nest of regulations and um, policies, and that actually costs more. It's a larger portion of your solar installation than any of the equipment, which is usually under twenty percent. If you haven't gone through this, you may not be familiar with it. But when I had the solar put on my roof here, um, the they finished the installation and they had to wait for the county inspector to come out and look at it. And so the county inspector scheduled to come out, you know, on, on the call the 17th of, of the, the time, May, I think. And he didn't say what time of day it'd come out. And he didn't say what kind of questions he'd have. So the solar installer had to have their top project manager sitting in my garage, in my driveway, in his truck, doing emails, waiting for the entire day for the county guy to come out. Wasted an entire day. Uh, one day he didn't show up. Um, and he came out and he said, well, I, the, the solar, the, the battery, the fuse, the, the circuit breaker on your power wall is the wrong size. And, the, and the, the county guy said that. And my installer said, well, look, here's the Tesla manual. And they've tested it and installed 200,000 of these. And this is what it says. And the county guy says, I, I, you're wrong. You can't, I'm not going to approve this. And the installer guy said, well, have you ever seen one of these before? And, and the county inspector said, no, I've never seen one. And so if I put the breaker in here that you're telling me, Mr. County Inspector, it's going to become more dangerous. County Inspector said, do it anyway, or it's not approved. So that, then it got approved. Then we had to wait for Georgia Power to come out. That was a whole nother pickup truck in my driveway for a day. So that's why it's so expensive in the United States. In Australia, um, you can usually have it approved uh, and uh, automatically commissioned within a few hours. So you know, sort of wrapping it up, uh, local energy is faster, it's cleaner, it's cheaper and many other benefits. And for people, for those of you that are entrepreneurially minded like I am, it may also be the biggest business opportunity in the history of business. In the last part of my book, I have fully 50 different emerging market segments just in local energy, each of which will be multiple billions of revenue per year around the world. Um, so this is an exciting idea that very few people have their head around. Hopefully I've gotten you interested today. As, as I sort of bring in the plane for landing metaphorically, you know, what can, what can we do? What can you guys do to realize this potential? Why is it that only 4% of America has rooftop solar? What do we need to do? Well, there's an app for that. Uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Labs, uh, hooked up with Rocky Mountain Institute, and several other uh, groups, Sunrun, and collaborated on an app and a, and a backend system that NREL um, helped build and support. It's called Solar App. And this brings a little bit of that Australian magic to the regulatory process. And it's an app that allows a, a, civic, a jurisdiction, a civic jurisdiction, to not have to go visit it. It says, you know, take a photo, take a photo with the app, and then, then a photo shows up on someone's computer sitting at their desk at the county, in my case. Uh, my county hasn't adopted it, but if they did, the, the person wouldn't have been able to, it wouldn't have had to come out, wouldn't have had to get in a car, wouldn't have had to wait. Um, it automates the entire process. It standardizes 90% of the systems. So that's another um, area where you wait. The solar installer has to submit um, single line diagrams, I think they're called, 
to the local county to make sure that they're wired properly. Well, the solar app understands the vast majority of basic wiring and it just says this is approved. Um, and it takes an average of 20 days for approvals in the United States down to the same day. Sadly, only 16 jurisdictions in the US have adopted it. There's 400 reviewing it, but there's 20,000 in the US. So if there's, you know, first thing you guys can do if, you're, if you feel passionately about this is uh, to reach out to the communities you're part of uh, and tell them, hey, take a hard look at uh, the solar app because it works, it's free, and we'll be putting rooftop solars up in, in, in hours, not months. The second thing is also in my book. Um, it's what I call a local energy bill of rights. And I think this is an important concept. Um, there's really, there's, there's five things that I think should be inherent. The goal is that they should not be arguable by anyone, who, even if they don't particularly like rooftop solar. Now listen, we have the right to produce and take care of our own resiliency. We should be able to be self-reliant. That's a very distinctively American trait. Uh, right, uh, conservatives and liberals both feel the same way. I want my community to take care of itself. I want to uh, be able to have the choice. And so this is something that we need. We, we need to be able to have our communities look after themselves. Uh, we need to be able to manage our own electric distribution. Uh, we should be able to have a single meter of utility, single uh, utility for meter, utility meter for our neighborhood or our, our campus or our town uh, in Europe. They're, they've rolled out a concept called energy communities, which basically just pushes the meter from a house to a set of houses and buildings and allows all the people behind that meter to be their own market. Uh, and it's a game changer. The one I feel most strongly about is it, it should be a fair value. You know, you, as I'm sure you guys are very aware, California is at the center of the world right now for debates over net metering. And your public utility commission absolutely lost its mind and put out, a, I mean, a terribly short-sighted, um, well, it was basically written, the, the investigative journalists have found it was written, um, the first draft was written by the utilities. Um, and it basically would have made rooftop solar completely unaffordable for anybody in the state. Uh, they have a new one that just came out. Um, it's still gonna be one of the worst in the, in the country. It's pretty bad, by the way, when California's net metering is worse than Georgia, just saying. And that's what you're looking at. Um, and here's, here's where I come down. As long as the utility has a monopoly on buying my electricity, as long as I, as long as I can't sell my electricity to anybody I want, which is, which is illegal in the United States, then the utility should pay me what my neighbor would pay me for it. Let me say that again. If I, sell, if I was allowed to sell electricity in a market like I can sell anything else, uh, I could sell my phone to you. I could sell my car to you. I could sell my house to you. Um, but I cannot sell a kilowatt hour to you. That is absolutely illegal in the United States. And so, but if I could, um, you would pay me as my neighbor what you pay the utility. Full net metering, right? And so um, that's, uh, and until we have the right to do that, the utilities have to pay us what our neighbors would pay us, which is what California is fighting so hard to have done. And then, and then just, and I think the last one, energy equity, um, as we roll out local energy, we have to be incredibly cognizant to make sure that the opportunities to have community solar, rooftop solar are available to everybody. Um, the only reason it's not is credit. And a lot of folks, over half the folks in the United States, families in the United States do not have a credit score high enough to get rooftop solar. And uh, that's something the government could easily intervene on uh, with loan guarantees, laws, uh, and there's a huge amount of nonprofit and advocacy work taking care of it today while the government is inactive on that. And the last thing for you guys to do, and boy, you guys are good at it in California, man, uh, is just be heard. You know, I, I, I never heard of anyone putting a sign on a beat on sand in a beach, but uh, sure as California did. You know, Governor Newsom, solar, not oil marching up and down the state, people marching to his house. I love the giant, the giant utility man there in the bottom left. Um, Californians do this right, and you're great at it, and the world is watching what you do in local energy. What happens next is gonna determine the fate of the country and local energy in California. So I wish you the best of luck um, in, in making the case to your regulators and legislators, to your communities, that local energy is 
uh, the single best way to help your communities to give your citizens choices to, and to deal with climate, to reduce climate change and increase your resiliency. So uh, that's my uh, that's my presentation. Thank you so much for listening and um, happy to uh, answer some questions. Oh, wait a minute. I have one other thing really quickly. Um, Meryl uh, wanted me to give away, ask me if I wouldn't mind giving away a few signed books. So um, if you would be interested in having one of these books uh, mailed to you, signed by me, you have to be the very first to answer these. I'm going to give away three. Uh, very first to type the answer into chat. All right. I'm going to start with a pretty easy one. Um, how many more jobs are created uh, when you install local energy compared to utility scale solar? Uh, oh, wow, look at that. All right, Marissa was the fastest. Second question. Um, what year will rooftop solar on average in the United States become one quarter the price of the average electric utility cost in the United States? 2050, first answer, Beverly, right. Beverly got it. Um, and then the last one's kind of hard. You had to watch very carefully. Um, what was the site of the largest industrial spill in the history of the United States? And any description works here. Okay. Uh, it's Kentucky. So that is uh, John. So that one you had to, thank you, John. That's the one you had to read this fine print. I'm pretty sure, actually, I'll go back and double check. <laughs> but now I'm, I'm questioning myself, but uh, pretty sure that's the one it is. We will double check that fact and whoever got the answer first will get the third signed book. So uh, thank you for that little drill, Meryl. Thank you for suggesting it. That was, I've never done that before. I do a lot of presentations, never done that one. I like it. I'll do it all the time going forward. Uh, and again, thank you all. If there's any questions, I think there might have been some while we were talking. Uh, and I will let you guys uh, pick the ones you want and we can have a discussion. We're going to go ahead and turn it over to Jose Torre Bueno, the CEO of uh, the C CCE. And Jose, please introduce yourself and uh, what you're doing with CCE, please. Okay. <clears throat> I'm the director of the Center for Community Energy. We are actually an organization here in San Diego whose mission is to promote what we call distributed energy resources, which is exactly the kind of thing that Bill was talking about. We are, among other things, an intervener before the PUC, which means we advocate for what it's worth before the PUC on these issues of uh, local energy. Uh, we've been particularly promoting uh, the idea of vehicle to grid as a form of local energy. Um, and we uh, love to have anybody else who wants to work with us join us. Our website is centerforcommunityenergy.org, or one word. Uh, so I've been asked to co-moderate this and uh, transmit your questions. Anybody who has questions, please just type them into chat, and uh, we'll be reading them uh, to Bill. And I will start with the first question that John Hode put in. And um, with his permission, I'm going to actually generalize this question. He asked if local city councils want to install microgrids and subsidized housing complexes, are there legal issues to block actions by the uh, IOUs? And actually, I would generalize that question to say if any organization wants to install microgrids in any kind of complex, um, what legal issues currently block them? by the, either the government or the IOUs. Do you want to speak to what the status is right now? It varies by what town, what city, what state you live in tremendously. Hmm. Generally speaking, the, the challenge of putting a microgrid in a facility is less about laws that outlaw it. I'm, not, I'm sure there are some, but they're not widespread. The problem is it's death by a thousand cuts. Uh, there's uh, the amount of time, trouble, uh, filings, filings you didn't even know you had to do and the project stops for a year while somebody in city council has to prove something they've never seen before. These are the challenges for building microgrids uh, and, and it, it is, uh, it's getting better from the 
California and other, particularly in California and other places, but it's the teeny tiny hundreds of small things when you're trying to do something that crosses pollution and electric safety and building codes. Building codes are incredibly um, uh, material, no pun intended, for uh, uh, the getting approvals. And many times building code inspectors have never seen systems like microgrids before. Uh, so that's, uh, that's why Australia does a good job because they've consolidated all the rules around and just made a straight path towards um, installing solar at least. I can add a little bit to that in California, um, you're not allowed to share power across more than one property line. Yes. And in an apartment building by law, the utility gets to install their meter in each apartment. You can't currently have a single meter for an apartment building in California. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's to, to what you were saying about the right to combine and have a, a single meter for a group. At this point in California, the utilities tentacles, so to speak, extend into individual apartments. Um, Aaron, you want to take the next question? Let's see who's put a question in. Okay, sorry, Jose. I think I'm I'm on here for coming up or pulling up the next question for us. Uh, let's see. So Merrill Merrill Leeds is asking, uh, in your opinion, Bill, what are the most effective ways to uh, to induce the CPUC to stop their relentless efforts to tax tax distributed solar. Oh my gosh! I, you know, <laughs> if you'd asked me five years ago, not knowing about California in detail, this I would say California is the least likely state to be making trouble for something like this. And in fact, the state it's the 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 I know a little bit about. Uh, I got pulled in. I interviewed um uh, Bernadette Del Cairo on my. Uh, 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 on my podcast and have had lots of people talk about the uh, California's particular journey on net metering and the proposal that came out last year was so bad and so egregious you know the fact that two of your, as I understand it two of your commissioners planned to retire before it would have been the, the timing of the retirements preceded when it was going to get agreed on or not I mean just the all the crazy things that happened around it were just like what's going on. And, uh, you know, and, and I believe in California, your public utility commissioners are appointed by the governor. In Georgia, we vote on them. I, I honestly think both are, I have no better solution, but they're both rife with problems and, and uh, confused interests and things like that. Uh, so I can tell you, it doesn't, doesn't guarantee good outcomes in Georgia when you vote for them, because most people don't even know what a public utility commissioner is. Uh, they just vote for them by their political, um, they're either red or blue and you know, people vote for them on that. So it doesn't lead towards hiring, voting for people that are good at it. Um, you know, I think that uh, the one thing that I was surprised about when I was researching the book, uh, certainly in Georgia, and I'm guessing the case in California, uh, is that, you know, in many cases, uh, the public utility commissioners are people you can talk to. You can certainly go down to their offices, you can listen to their hearings, you can obviously, there's a mechanism to intervene as you guys are doing or as Jose is doing, uh, but as citizens, you can write letters, you can go sit, sit in meetings. I sat in a public utility hearing um, in Georgia a couple of years ago. I've actually sat down with three of the commissioners and talked to them. I just, in fact, uh, yesterday I was, um, uh, did a speed, a one-on-one -on -one to an audience like this and the other person questioning me was one of the, the longest running commissioner, public utility commissioner in Georgia. And uh, he has made himself very accessible to me. Uh, I don't agree with most of the things that he uh, believes in, but he's nonetheless, in his case, seems to be a good public servant minded, um, trying to listen to what his you know, voters are saying. And uh, I respect that. And so I think that um, I'm surprised that in Georgia, you can talk to the public utility commissioners and actually have a conversation with them. I have no idea uh, if that works in California. I feel like, <laughs> 
a lot more people know who your commissioners are more actively. If you do talk to them, you have to put it on public record that you did it. Wow, yeah. I think in areas like this, California is very evolved. Um, um, in Georgia, no one knows what they do and no one cares because it's a vertically integrated utility. Um, and so, uh, but uh, we'll see this the particular commissioner was the was the sole reason that we had any net metering at all in Georgia. We had full net metering for 5,000 people. And the math that they used to project the net metering was that it would take four years to use it. Um, those 5,000 slots, they used it in like three months. Uh, and now people are livid because their installer said, you know, of course you can get in. And then they didn't. And so it's quite a hullabaloo here in Georgia. Um. Uh, please, everybody, put your questions in. Uh, the next question I have is from Brocade Wu, who asks about um, solar shingles. And what do you think about solar shingles as opposed to solar panels? I think solar shingles are a, one of the most exciting areas in solar innovation. I think it's, it's quite a haul for us in the United States to manufacture our own solar panels because of the history and China's got so much scale. But I do think that we can restart our solar manufacturing industries here with things that are more innovative and higher margin like solar shingles. Um, I live in a neighborhood where uh, the, the homeowners association does not allow solar panels on the roof, at least not visible from the street. And uh, so therefore I don't have as much solar in my roof as I would like. Solar shingles will allow me to do that. The problem with solar shingles is it's still very formative technology. Uh, I've talked to more people in Europe that are innovating in that area than in the United States. But I do think that in 10 years, um, solar shingles will be ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitously available. You can get them at Home Depot or whatever. And I, I think that it will it will look back and say, why were we wringing our hands over it? It's an obvious solution. Now, is the making a solar shingle, it's, it requires more materials, it takes more labor, so it's likely to always be more expensive than panels. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a solar shingle, but they're, you know, they're, they're not nearly as large as a panel, the ones I've seen. And, um, um, but if you include the price of uh, shingling a traditional roof, in there, then it is actually cheaper. So if you ask yourself, what's it like for me to put shingles on my roof and put traditional solar panels on my roof when I build my house or I'm retrofitting my roof, um, solar shingles will be cheaper than the two together, but solar shingles will be more expensive than panels by themselves. Um, but you know, another fun fact, the solar, the people like all of us that are advocating for uh, local energy across the country, we have, we have been ineffective as a voice. But the folks decades ago that thought about that put uh, um, TV dishes on our roofs, uh, dish network and, and the like, they um, they managed through concerted lobbying to get a national law passed that it, it is illegal for a homeowners association to disallow uh, um, uh, TV dishes on a roof. But we don't have the same protections nationally for solar. Go figure, right? Um, I, I saw I saw one other question, which I, I wanted to answer real quick about uh, rooftop uh, wind. And uh, this comes up a lot. It's a great question. You know, back in the late 1800s, there was a company called Jacobs Wind, and they sold 25,000 small wind turbines for farms to charge batteries before there was anything close to grids being available. Um, and then the very first, uh, very, very, very first uh, DER, and I think in the country, was on a, a wind turbine on the roof in Brooklyn, um, and they, they had to get permission to connect into the grid, and uh, it's a great story. But what has happened is that wind has fallen behind solar dramatically. I think maybe five or ten times. I'd have to look up the number, but if you want to generate a watt of energy on a roof for a dollar, uh, solar is just substantially, substantially cheaper than wind. And uh, so even in the windiest places, solar is going to be cheaper. And, and one of the truisms of wind is that the higher you go, the, the, cheap, the more wind consistency and the more volume of wind blows. And so if you're just going to do a small scale wind turbine on your roof or 
you know, a 50 foot pole behind your barn in a farm, you're just not reaching the really good wind. Uh, the good news about solar is uh, it's pretty much just as good at, you know, 10 feet off the ground as it is 10,000 feet off the ground. On that issue of height, since by local regulations, you can't raise a wind turbine to a height such that it would fall on your neighbor's property, mm. that restricts anybody on a small lot from having a high enough pole to be adequate. It's really only suitable for people with large properties. And as you say, it's not as cost effective as solar. Uh, Marion, you want to read the next question? Marion? Uh, I'll, I'll take that, Jose. Let me see. Um, gosh, there's so many good questions here. I'm just trying to kind of, there's a few that are kind of similar, but uh, we have some questions related to uh, concerns about um, uh, material, uh, you know, materials use um, and mining and disposal issues surrounding batteries. Yep. Um, what's being done about that? Uh, what are the limitations? Um, and, and, and also for solar as well as batteries. There's I've got a whole chapter in the book uh, called The Battle for Public Opinion because there is so much misinformation about these very questions. And I personally, I was curious about this, this kind of question, like how, what is the waste stream from a tired solar gonna be? Uh, what's the, the chemical issues of batteries when we start disposing of them, right? And so I, I, I try to find stuff, but time and time again, what I found was, was sort of a hand-waving answer with a little bit of data or a scientific paper that was inscrutable and didn't apply in any usable way. And so I, part of the reason the book took so long, probably half the book's life time was to go and find uh, very uh, authoritative sources and stitch them together uh, into conclusions that I put in the book. But if, if, and I'll give you some of those to answer the questions, but if you, if what, I, what I'm saying doesn't resonate with you or you're skeptical, I'd encourage you to go, to go to the book or go to my website and I cite, I cite the sources and I show the math and the math is actually on my web pages with the spreadsheets and you can tweak the spreadsheets on my website to see if you, know, if you wanna try different numbers to see the outcomes differently. But um, uh, so the, the one that Georgia got hung up on was the fact that our, if we put up, if we keep putting up this gosh darn solar, we're gonna be overflowing the Georgia um, uh, landfills with retired solar panels in 20 or 30 years. It's gonna be a tragedy. Um, and so they actually stopped some proceedings to go look at this. Uh, I think it faded away because it's a ridiculous question. That's a ridiculous assertion. So let me give you some numbers and I won't get them exactly right. But um, the, if you take all the solar panels that were installed in the United States in 2020, I think, the, um, the volume, if you threw every single bit of them away, uh, the volume would be one tenth the volume of other e-wastes like cell phones and televisions. So in a, in the worst solar panels are a tiny portion of the electric waste stream. The e-waste stream is 125th of the broader municipal waste stream. Um, so solar is a rounding error when it comes to um, uh, landfills. And the great news is that, and I have many studies cited in the book, uh, somewhere between 80 and 95% of everything in a solar panel can be completely recycled. Uh, solar panels, for example, the biggest weight in solar panels are aluminum frames. The second biggest is glass, or I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Um, and uh, aluminum is super easy to recycle. Glass has coatings on a little harder to recycle, but there's dozens and dozens of companies solving that problem. So you go out in 10 years and 90, 95% of the solar panel will be recyclable. So we will put in, putting nothing into the uh, landfills. And uh, there's a cool company that I talked about in my book and I have one in my office, uh, not here, but downtown. And it's two pieces of glass. And when it's done, it lasts for 50 years. And when you're done with it, you just take an X-Acto knife down between the two pieces of glass. It doesn't have any glues, any plastics. The solar cells all just fall out in the ground. 
and the wires fall on the ground, you can just stick them up and put them in a recycle bin. Um, and there's, there's, and in, in Europe, you have to actually bond the, uh, the, uh, the cleanup of a, a solar, solar installation. Uh, so there's money left over when it's removed to be taken care of. Uh, so th there's a built-in market. That's a simple thing the government does. It doesn't raise the price a lot, um, but it guarantees there's a market for recyclability. Teeny little signals like that have such an impact and the governments just don't even come close to stuff like that, but they should. Um, batteries are a little more complicated. They have a lot of uh, varying chemicals, a lot more sophisticated manufacturing. But uh, have any of you guys heard of uh, a guy named uh, J.B. Straubel? Is that a name anybody knows? Yeah, Merrill's nodding. Yeah, a couple of people. So you might have heard of a company he started and was the CTO of. It's called Tesla. So uh, if you want to, if you've ever ridden in a Tesla or ever seen a power wall or power pack, you can thank Mr. Straubel um, because he and his teams were the geniuses that created it. Well, he decided that the biggest opportunity in business for uh, in the future was recycling. So he uh, left Tesla, raised, I think, $500 million. I mean, he was counting. And uh, he's now built Redwood Materials, which is one of maybe a dozen high profile battery recycling companies in the United States. So um, if you have a bunch of batteries today, it's not exactly clear how you could recycle them uh, to the same degree how you could recycle solar. But I think in 10 years, batteries will be incredibly recyclable. And what Straubel says, and I quote him in my book, uh, is that he said, the great thing about lithium ions and, 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 and uh, uh, sorry, lithium atoms and all the other materials is they're infinitely recyclable. You know, a lithium ion, a lithium, ad, a lithium atom never becomes unrecyclable. So you have sometimes have to remove it from other things, but the atom itself will last the history of the universe. Um, and so we just have to pull those atoms out and we can put them back to work. And uh, every month I see new uh, announcements about breakthrough technologies to recycle batteries. So I think this problem is going to get taken care of and it's going to make a lot of innovators really wealthy fixing it. Great question. Okay. Another question, uh, Beverly Deschamps wants to know about um, offshore wind. Is that like uh, kind of remote power? Is there a concern about the distances you have to bring it? What, what role do you see that playing? I have asked, I have the great privilege of asking hun hundred, hundreds of the smartest energy people. And I ask a question time and time again to the smartest people I talk to. I said, wh wh why do we do offshore wind? Um, and, uh, you know, I get answers like, uh, it's got a higher capacity factor, which means the wind blows more steadily. And so instead of getting 30% of the time, you get the turbine turning, you might get it 40, 45% of the time. Uh, uh, you can build them bigger. We can't build them any bigger, but then I come back to this really nagging question of like, doesn't it cost two or three times as much money as solar and onshore wind does? And then that's where everybody just looks at me and say, well, but governments want to do it. So, okay. So I think it's a fact that we're going to have a lot of nuclear, we're going to have nuclear power plants for the foreseeable future, maybe even new ones. We're going to have tons of offshore wind in the United States and Europe and everywhere else, because there's this momentum behind it. We're going to have hydrogen, whether you pay attention to the fact that hydrogen is incredibly expensive. Um, governments love hydrogen. They love offshore wind. They're going to make uh, they're going to make it work. So I think irrespective of the technology and the costs, offshore wind is a big part of our future. And uh, our electric bills will be higher because of it. It'd be a lot cheaper if we all just put solar on our rooftops, but that's not what governments seem inclined to do. And so um, they love offshore wind. They're going to support it. Biden loves it. We're going to see it. And it will be cleaner energy than coal plants and be cheaper than coal plants. And so um, I think it's overall goodness but it's gonna get choked because we don't have enough transmission uh, to carry it back. And, um, uh, but I am optimistic that uh, it will help the problem more than hurt it. Marion, you wanna take a question? Okay. Um, we have a couple of re good related questions here. I'm gonna read them both to you, Bill, and then uh, you can uh, take it Take it from there. So let's see. Um, Marie, Margarita Para says, thanks, uh, thanks for your presentation. What would be the ideal role for big utilities with local energy, distributed energy resources, going massive? 
And John Eldon asks, in California, what can we do? We can start by firing the CPUC. So <laughs> your thoughts. Oh, man. You know, the utilities have this really big aversion to doing anything other than selling electrons or kilowatt hours. And it started because of your state. The entire country is, uh, all the utilities across the country, particularly here in the South, will call out California as this prime example of why um, distributed systems and, and competitive systems shouldn't work because I forget what, 20 years ago, uh, California decided to create a competitive market for power. And uh, is one of the, uh, ja uh, ja Jasco was his name, uh, the, arguably the greatest regulator design uh, person in history said that the uh, California regulations for the competitive market back in the early noughts or late nineties, I forget, um, was the most complicated regulation that had ever been created by mankind. Um, and so what happened was a group of people out of Texas uh, decided to start trading electricity on California's markets and they were geniuses and they saw all the loopholes. There was a little company called Enron. And so Enron gamed the crap out of California's electricity markets and crashed the electricity system, rolling blackouts. Some of you may be old enough to remember that and, uh, and nearly bankrupt the state who had to bail out the entire electricity market. So um, this is the reason that utilities point to say, let us just do the basic stuff we've done for a hundred years. Uh, you know, California's examples, uh, you know, as soon as we let anything out of our control as utilities, you know, we get, uh, we get uh, nauseous uh, and get hives. And they do. And so, uh, and distributed energy resources are even worse um, because it's not just a couple of crazy brainiac people in uh, Texas trading electricity, but it's millions of homes, uh, none of which they can control. And they really, they really find it unnerving. And I've talked to numerous um, uh, utility executives who've told me that you can't have a grid with that many DERs and you can't manage it. And I say, the problem with your thesis is that I'm from the computer industry. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of Google, right? But Google's got 100 million independent computers are all working in, in parallel to each other to produce this thing called cloud computing. It is actually an age old computing problem to have multiple different systems coordinating on a backplane. It's very straight, it, it's a known problem. It's, it, electricity isn't bits, I, I don't wanna overgeneralize, but um, just because, it hasn't been done in electricity doesn't mean that it's a new, a brave new world. It's something that you can absolutely get your head around and um, uh, you just have to, you just have to lean into it. I mean, there was a day when they said you couldn't have more than 15% of renewable uh, capacity on a grid because the grid would crash, you know, when California just hit hundred percent the other day and uh, you know, Southwest power pool hits it all the time. Uh, so the utilities are incredibly conservative. They have no R and D at all. And so they, they just get stuck in the, I don't want the DER thing, but I'll tell you the future. And I have a whole section of my book. And by the way, I didn't, this is some pretty wonky stuff. So I, I, uh, I didn't come up with it on my own. I found the smartest guy in the country that speaks English. Uh, I mean, sorry, speaks normal person stuff, not regulatory ease. Uh, Peter Fox Penner and wrote Power After Carbon. This is a hard book to read, I got to tell you. But I interviewed him. He's on my podcast. Uh, he's a... Uh, one of the top analysts, and he has some models that I give a very brief overview of my book. But in short, um, uh, power companies become eBay. They're not Walmart, they're eBay. They don't sell the goods, they trade them. They make money every time it trades. Their profits will go through the roof. Their absolute profits will be higher. Their revenue will be smaller, but their absolute profits will be higher. Their percentage profits will be through the roof. So, um, uh, that's uh, the, quite, the problem is that power companies just can't even fathom how to get from A to B. And even if they wanted to, they've got innumerable uh, regulators fighting them saying, CUP, CPUC saying, we're not going to put all this stuff at risk. We're not going to do that. And, um, and I'm just going to find, where is it? Um, my absolute favorite business book, I can't find it, is uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. And basically it makes the case, by, it's by Clayton Christensen, my favorite business book of all time. And it makes the case that 
when you have a large institutional organization, power companies in this case, they become so locked into their status quo business model that they are absolutely incapable of changing it. There you go. All right. Yeah. I don't know where my copy is. You go. It's around here somewhere. Um, and, uh, and so that's, and, and, and if you ever wanted proof of that working, just look at Silicon Valley, right? It's a little place up North for you guys. And it's, uh, uh, there's no way that a bunch of people working in the garages could have taken on IBM. It was not even conceivable yet. They completely, I worked at IBM, right? I sold my company at IBM, took IBM off the map, uh, a bunch of startup crazy people that didn't shower very often. And, uh, they changed the world. And that same group of people, same garages are going to be redefining the energy systems and electricity systems in the next 20 years. And it's going to be, the only difference is that the amount of money that's going to flow through those companies and through the new energy systems is about 25 times more money than all the money that's ever flowed through everything, internet and computers. The amount of money and energy dwarfs even today's money in computing uh, and internet. So uh, it's going to be a, uh, I think Silicon Valley is going to be one of the big leaders uh, in this uh, next generation of energy, but I think uh, the rest of the world is going to play a role as well. And the rest of the world is going to do particularly well because they're actually enabling competition like in Europe and the United States is locking it down, preventing it. So it's, uh, it's, it's a decent chance the United States will, um, through inability to make policy at a federal level, hand off a key market to somebody else like we have with solar panels and things like that. But hopefully not. Hopefully we'll rise to the occasion and uh, create the systems that allow utilities to be successful and innovate our way out of the climate problem. That's a good segue to Beverly's question. She wants to know about the company that you founded on solar panels. So I, uh, I just to qualify this, I spend maybe uh, an hour a week on it, but it's a really fun, super nerdy company. Uh, when I was researching the book, I wanted to understand at the most fundamental level how solar kept getting cheaper, like at the atoms and chemistry level. And I found one of the probably 10 smartest solar physicists in the United States and he was out of Georgia Tech, and he had started a company some of you may remember called Cineva. And he was one of the he was the scientist that came up with their stuff. It was one of the two large American solar companies before they shut down. Absolute genius, great guy. And uh, we became friends. And one night over beers, I said, "So what would you do if you could do anything?" And he said, "Well, I have this idea." And so I said, "Tell me about your idea." And uh, he explained a, a very simple technique that. Uh, was unintuitive and unknown to the broad solar industry that allows you to take an existing solar manufacturing factory that makes traditional um, solar cells. Here's one of our cells. So one of these standard cells, which you, I don't know if you've ever seen one on its own, but this is what a standard solar cell looks like. And, uh, you know, you see them in panels, 60 or 72 in a panel. Um, there's a, they're made on, a, I think, a seven step, seven step process. And uh, we have a slight modification to the last step and it produces, uh, increases the power and dramatically reduces the silver, which is one of the most expensive parts of making this. And it took us the last three years to get a patent on it. And so now that we have the patent, um, I'm not a fan of patents in general. I think they're kind of slows things down. They're necessary, but, uh, but in this case, um, it costs a couple billion dollars to get in the solar manufacturing business. So we're gonna to try to license that patent to people in uh, Europe and India. And uh, we were well along with people in China and uh, those conversations got frosty. And so um, uh, it's, a, it's a slow, slow conversation, but hopefully in the next couple of years we'll have licensed the, uh, the invention and the patent that he has come up with. And if everyone in the world today used this technology, we would uh, save $500 million a year on the cost of producing solar. So it's a, it's a big number. It's a cool invention. And uh, he's got a couple other ideas that we're going to go after once we start making money on the first one, all of which increase the effectiveness of traditional solar um, cells. Okay. And Merrill is asking, uh, what strategies would you suggest to uh, stimulate individual municipalities to enact policies to promote local energy development? Um, are you, I, I assume you guys are familiar with Solar United Neighbors? 
I'm not seeing a lot of knots. I know, I know I am. I don't know about others. So you just do what they do what they do. I mean, they, they were doing it more for buying solar. Um, and they created buying communities like Solarize, which is another one you might be familiar with. But uh, Solar United Neighbors does a wonderful job of not only facilitating uh, families, many low-income families and, and suburban, and the entire range of uh, income levels getting access to solar and affordably by mass purchasing and mass building out solar projects or so rooftop solar, but they also get involved in the advocacy. And uh, I interviewed the woman who started it, Anya Schoolman, uh, in a podcast, and she's uh, profiled in my book, and I've also written some articles on her. She's just an absolute force. Uh, she's inspiring. And her website, uh, Solar United Neighbors, S-U-N, is uh, just full of specific tactical tips on how to reach out to your, uh, to your local governments to get them to open their minds to embracing solar policy and making it easier and faster for people to put solar on the roofs. So it's just a playbook. And there's several other organizations. If you go to my website, I think I've got the six top organizations. They're, they're the top top, but the six top organizations that are basically through which you can channel your funds or your time or your energy to promote local energy. Another one just to check out if you're writing down is Generation 180. Uh, another organization that I really am a fan of, uh, they have, uh, they're focused on schools, solar for schools, it's, but it's a very, but their value proposition is so clear and so universally embraced uh, that, uh, you know, everybody wants to help schools. So that's, uh, they've, they've picked a narrower target, but they're quite effective and they're well-funded, Generation 180. Okay, well, do we have any other questions? I, I kind of had one bill that, uh, so I was at the uh, Don't Tax Solar uh, rally last week in LA, and um, Vincent Battaglia, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name correctly, he is the founder and CEO of Renova Energy in Riverside County. And he got up on the stage and I thought he made a really good point about how the, our response to the utilities is always, you know, we're just putting out these little, or these fires that, that, that they're just starting one after another. And, and it, we're kind of treating the symptoms and we're not trying to cure the disease <laughs> of, um, you know, monopoly utilities um, where, you know, we, we battle them every time they want to change net ener energy metering um, to make it, you know, very, you know, solar, not uh, financially uh, attractive to people. And, um, and he suggested that we make, that we, maybe we should be making a glide path for the utilities. Like we should be making their, basically their demise um, less painful um, or doing something to, you know, help them, um, you know, uh, uh, close down less painfully and with, with less fighting and, uh, so I was wondering what your thoughts about that are. I'm sure he has a lot more expertise than I do, uh, but I would have to say that uh, I think it's, I can't imagine a scenario where utilities don't exist in some variation of what they are today. We absolutely need utilities. We need water companies. We need a lot of the, we need police departments and schools and um, the economics of having a single organization that manages that infrastructure is actually really positive. Uh, at least from the wires point of view. Um, so I just don't, so what I do think is we need to restructure the utilities. So if I take what he or you're telling me he said and I change it to can we create a glide path towards a smarter model of utilities, um, uh, I would uh, I would then, I would, I would love to see what, I would hand him uh, Peter Fox Henry's book and say, well, he's got an entire book about that glide path and I don't understand all of it. It's incredibly complicated. So can you explain to me how to do it? And, and there's a, you know, he, he may be more knowledgeable about this than Peter Fox Penner, but there's a good bet he isn't. And uh, I would say, uh, 
it's it's um my my problem and i don't want to step on anybody's toes but my problem with the uh calls for that is they feel they sound the same to me as let's um let's get the the republicans and the democrats to agree on things so we can get some change done right yeah absolutely let's do that but i i don't know how to do that they're not listening to me i've called several of them they don't take my phone calls I've written them letters saying you should talk to the other people and they're not changing their patterns. They don't seem to care. And so um, I don't think that the, 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 the utilities are, are not going to be changed by fiat. They're not going to be changed by utility commissioners. They're not going to be changed probably by legislators. Um, uh, there's a fantastic history. If you want to understand the arc of how I think utilities will change, you need to look only at AT&T, the largest regulated monopoly in the history of the world. And um, if you go back and look at when the government was wrangling with them, the AT&T was making the identical arguments that the utilities make today that, hey, if we have to open up to competition, um, it's going to jack up our underlying costs because not everyone's paying for the infrastructure and that's going to harm low income families and they're not going to be able to afford their telephone bills and we're an essential service. Exactly the same arguments. And uh, again, I've never, I've never read anyone else other than my book that pointed this out. I actually got this, the, 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 the speech that the CEO of AT&T made where he said those things. And, and um, it wasn't the, that the government really overrode AT&T. It was that MCI and a group of others made a better case. And so I think if, what we need to do is show it's going to take a while but you are the best state, the best place in the world to show what innovation can do. You have innovate, you have more innovation on your little fingers than most of the country does in its whole, you know, its whole hands. And uh, you, you need to show it's possible. Uh, LA is doing some great work with just a, a big scale, but they're doing some great work in, in, in sort of energy design and things like that. So I would say that, um, uh, we need to create demonstrations that the old way is no longer the best way and that the new ways are safer. And that what happened in California with the Enron meltdown is uh, will not happen again if you uh, embrace innovation. Um, and so I do think that uh, it's a hard slog, but ultimately I'm a techno optimist to a fault. And I think in 10 years, these will be different discussions. The discussions are going to be, um, holy cow, the utilities are going to go bankrupt. Uh, they're not going to be able to service the majority of people who don't have rooftop solar and battery. This is terrible. What are we going to do? Uh, California is going to bail them out. State keeps bailing out the utilities, whether it's Enron meltdowns or PG&E wildfires that keep bailing out the utilities. Why do they do it? Because life without utilities is untenable. Uh, you know, there's a, I think it was the previous president that said um, everyone likes renewable energy until uh, the wind dies down and their television quits working. Uh, I don't agree with most of his position on anything with energy, but that was, that was a true statement. And uh, I think that um, uh, the utilities will and the regulators and the entire industry around them. It, this is one of the largest industries on the planet Earth. It's going to only change because it's going to be forced from the outside. That's why the title of my book is uh, Disrupt the Global Energy Industry from the Outside In. So I guess that's my very long answer to the question is the, uh, there is, we can do all the glide paths in the world and I give you 250 studies that show you the glide path. Um, but I think it's gonna be a disruption from the outside in, just like AT&T, just like computers and IBM, just like mobile phones. It's gonna be an outside in disruption. And then the utilities will be on their heels. We'll have an entirely different conversation. I wish it wasn't going to be that way, but uh, yep. there, in the history of monopolies, I don't believe anyone, any of them has ever embraced change. It's awfully, re it's awfully good to be a monopoly. You can, you can cause wildfires and you can kill people and you can pollute the environment to a degree that's almost uncognizable, well beyond immoral, and your profits are guaranteed. And if you make horrible business mistakes and build a nuclear power plant that you don't need and nobody wants, uh, you don't have to account, no consequences at all. Your shareholders are it's totally covered. Your profits are totally covered because you'll, your regulators just force your citizens to pay for it. And um, so I think that 
I don't want to sound like it's impossible to advocate for change with utilities. I think we should continue trying, but I think the change is going to come from the outside. So Bill, I think the two words that I am going to really cling to is embrace innovation. And um, I think that's something we all need to do. And I just want to step in here because we are getting kind of late in the evening and I'm sure it's much we later where you us. are. But um, we want to thank you so much for uh, sharing your expertise with us and helping us understand a little bit more about the topic and your exciting book. And um, we always like to present our speakers with a little something. So hang on here just a sec. Are you going to screen share, Meryl? If, it, if it's an NFT, we're going to have to have a conversation. <laughs> no, what we have done. Uh, oh, I love this. Appreciation is we have bought a tree in your honor. And it's going to be planted here in California. So now you're going to have to come out and visit California. You'll have a reason. Uh, but actually, you can go online, though. You can uh, actually see the tree that was planted in your behalf, and it's going to be in an area that has been burned by wildfires. So, you know, so I again, mean, I don't want to sound gushy, but I'm literally choked up. Oh, um, good. I think this is so <laughs> cool. Good for Thank you guys. You. Well, Good thank you. you and thanks to everybody else who came and uh, we'll be getting the recording out really soon. And I'm going to say goodnight to everybody. So good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to save your chat file thank if you, you like it. Yeah, thank you so definitely. much, Bill. It was a fabulous presentation. Thank and you, Bill. Send me the email address, the uh, mailing addresses for the books. You got it. Mm -hmm. Take Will care, do. guys. Thank Have you. a great afternoon or evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.